All right, so uh, preaching to the choir here, but I guess I sort of started out my role that Jeppe said was to sort of review a little bit as to um, where we are in the field of uh, HIV vaccine development. So these are numbers that, that sort of roll off the, the lips. Uh, they're sort of astounding numbers, 50 years now of, an, of, a, of the pandemic of HIV. Globally, still 1.4 million infections a yearly. That's 5,000 a day. Lots of infants still infected, 37 million people now living with HIV, 76 since the epidemic, um, a lot of deaths. And in our country of the United States, we've tolerated 35 to 40,000 new infections a year. The green dot here is a slide from um, uh, Glenda, actually, that, that uh, looks at the target for adults and children newly infected with HIV that uh, UNAIDS has put there. And, we're not going to nearly come close to that target um, as far as um, uh, transmissions. Um, test and treat is an important strategy for individual health and have an effect on transmission. U equals U is correct. Um, however, long-term adherence and prompt identification of HIV infection is just not translatable and scalable on a large scale. It's not a limited mother-to-child transmission. It has a very definable exposure. And these three articles in the last couple months in the New England Journal really show, yes, massive effort. You can reduce things by 15 to 20 percent. That doesn't mean um, we shouldn't be supporting of it. But this is not an AIDS-free generation approach. It's going to need something disruptive. And um, it's, that disruption is either going to have to be an HIV vaccine or a broadly neutralizing antibody cocktail or some long-acting um, broad antiretroviral. Uh, all of those will be discussed in this session um, uh, and uh, during this meeting. So with respect to um, the HIV vaccine field, um, we're at a very interesting time in that uh, we have several concepts in the field. We currently have um, uh, the AMP trials and um, uh, three vaccine trials, um, and I'll review these. Um, Glenda will talk about HVTN702, um, the largest of the trials, which is based on RV144. Um, uh, it has 5,400 South Africans, and it's an all-vac prime with an all-vac bivalent um, uh, clade C uh, boost with an MF59. Um, adjuvant. Um, the HVTN705 HPX2008 trial is the AD26 trial. Uh, it's based on the mosaic constructs that Dan Baruch um, developed with Betty Korber. Um, it has a mixture um, of uh, those mosaics, both on envelope and gag Paul. And the boost is a GP140 clade C um, uh, soluble protein. Um, <clears throat> that is a woman's trial. Um, uh, uh, 702 is a 70% women's trial. They're being essentially run almost simultaneously in, um, uh, in South Africa, and that uh, uh, is on purpose. Um, the 705 trial is a one-to-one -one randomization of about 2,600 women. Um, <clears throat> we are starting um, HPT, uh, HVTN 706, uh, HPX3002, which is essentially a, a very similar trial. The difference here is that the, that the protein boost is now a bivalent um, uh, protein uh, in which they use the clade C, C GP140, and the other protein is a synthetic, uh, essentially mosaic um, uh, GP140. Uh, those mosaic uh, antigens bring out much more of a clade B response. Um, the antibodies um, really uh, give higher titers to clade B. Um, the goal actually would be to take the clade C product, uh, if that showed, and bridge it to, to what um, the company want, hopes will be um, uh, a vaccine that will be more global. This is a trial in MSM and transgender men and women that is going to start probably in a month, a month and a half, in the United States, South America, and a couple selected uh, sites uh, in Europe. The issue is, when are we going to see uh, data on these trials? Um, they're all um, designed in a two-stage process. They're all, um, let's say, the ones that we're, that we're concentrated on at first, uh, that Glenn will talk about is 702, 705. Um, they're in two stages. They're under DSMB control. If you 
get to stage, uh, get through two years, uh, and there's, um, uh, the DSMB has the ability to extend the, the trial to three years. Um, we call that finishing stage two. Um, when 50% uh, entrance hit 24 months, well, that will be in April of 2020. Um, for the 705 trial, that's a year later. It'll be approximately May of 2021. And for 706, um, it'll be probably October of 2022. So the vaccine trials, um, um, anything, uh, what we'll know, we won't know any efficacy, will be of 702 passes into the second stage, which will be in April of 2020. Now, why did we do these expensive experiments of separate trials of non-neutralizing vaccine approaches. And I'll spend a little bit of time on that. They come from different areas. One is based on the RV144 uh, trial, um, uh, of which uh, there, there was led by a lot of the people in this room, the scientific effort that went into the correlates of protection. Uh, in RV144, the HVTN702, um, it is the V2 loop, uh, GP120 binding. ADCC, recently ADCP, and HIV-specific CD4 T-cell responses. The AD26 regimen comes from looking at uh, protection in low-dose challenge in primates, and it's GP140 binding uh, V2 plus and minus, really ADCP and LE spots. Both the magnitude and the epitope-specific responses in breath differ, uh, and uh, the overlap and diversity improve the ability to find what non-neutralizing immune responses are correlated and what areas of the viral envelope are susceptible to clinically effective immune pressure. All these efficacy trials are really designed to collect specimens to look at correlates protection, feeling that at best is we'll get partial protection and it's the correlate that will drive us to the ability to bring these vaccines from, well, maybe it'll be 40% or 50% from, or 60% to 70, 80, and 90%. Now, we know a fair amount about the comparison of the immune responses uh, between um, the 702 and the 705 regimens, the ALVAC regimen and AD26. Uh, we've had some direct comparisons. One of them is HVTN100 um, with uh, HVTN117, um, which essentially compares these two, compare the 702 regimen uh, with the um, 705 regimen. This spider plot, um, uh, really details um, that they're both overlapping and significantly different phys. Anything that has to do with um, uh, the GP41 uh, is m much more accentuated in the AD26. Uh, AD26 also gives some CD8 T cell responses. Um, interestingly, um, the HVTN100 um, will give um, some, to some images, uh, V2 loop responses um, better. Uh, some uh, GP120 response is better, um, albeit uh, in the end, V2 is probably uh, a little bit higher in, uh, in the AD26 regimen. The um, CD4 immune profile between these regimens do differ. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, sort of a, comp uh, a mosaic of the compass. Um, uh, data from uh, Julie's lab. Uh, this uh, here would be the HVTN100. Um, here would be um, the AD26 that uses an alum adjuvant. Um, if you go down here, you'll see that essentially IL4 responses and CD4 ligand responses are slightly better actually in the 702 response than in the 705 um, data when you just sort of Rorschach this, looking at better ways of anal uh, analyzing uh, these individual cytokines. Um, uh, data, but uh, they do give some differences in the cytokine profiles. To make it a little bit simpler, these are magnitude breath curves. Um, this is the GP120 clade C breath. Um, blue here is uh, the 702 regimen, and red uh, is the um, uh, AD26 regimen. Um, this is the V1, V2 clade C breath. Um, whoops, did I hit this? Uh, I hit this, yeah, the clay, uh, V1, V2, um, clade C breath. Um, here you see that HVTN117 one, uh, has a greater magnitude breath um, than, uh, than you see HVTN100. So the two trials are really quite harmonized regarding studies of correlates protection. 
And the potential to define a correlate that is associated with partial efficacy is actually quite high when we look at both of the, the, uh, of the trials. If we get some form of efficacy, and I've sort of put it at around 25% from a statistical point of view where, where we really will have um, a lot of data. 702 and 705, 706 will define the future of the non-neutralizing approach, in my opinion. I think it will be very hard to muster any more shots on goal for any non-neutralizing regimen until these studies are analyzed and the results are understood. Um, in fact, I sort of throw out that unless the non-human primate shows some magnificent data from a regimen or that we sort of move into the era where neutralizing based regimens um, and trimers aren't quite getting to the level of neutralization that we think we need and we start doing studies of looking at neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies, that we won't see these non-neutralizing antibody pro approaches of a vector prime and a, and a recombinant protein boost go very far until we actually understand what these trials are all about. I'm not talking about the CMV vectors or the, uh, or the chimp ad vectors or RNA based approaches. You know, everything will go into phase one. We can measure lots of things in phase one, but we're at this point in time whether non neutralizing, you know, where, where will we go with this non neutralizing hypothesis? And <clears throat> this is um, the HVTN uh, sort of pipeline that we, we look at here that sort of looks at the, stu the studies on the left-hand side and uh, et cetera. And, I'm, and I've highlighted essentially our non-neutralizing pipeline. And frankly, I sort of talked personally to all the developers of these, these um, vaccines to basically say the chances of going into phase to be efficacy trials in the next little while with any of these approaches is essentially nil. I see n n no emphasis from the NIH and maybe a philanthropical person will want to move forward to do the, one of these $80 million to $100 million experiments, but I don't see that happening until we take a look at what happens to these free fields. And <clears throat> we've been very realistic uh, with, the, with the developers of this to sort of say um, we will need to understand what's going on and, and we will take a pause and look at these uh, before we go forward. Our portfolio will be, as we discussed, um, in the uh, sort of lineage-based um, um, approaches, and I'll talk about the rest of the, the trimer kinds of approaches, which are sort of highlighted here. These are just the first of many that are undergoing. I'd also say something about HVTN702 in and of itself that there is little commitment from Sanofi or GSK to do anything at risk to lead to expeditious commercialization if there is success in HVTN702. We're working with products that are fine for phase 2B but are not commercialization ready and will require a significant amount of time to do this. And there's no, no appetite to, to put in this time and money to do this. Um, we are, in fact, looking to bring in an outside manufacturer to do the technical development required to bring the manufacturing process up to required standards. We're talking three to four years. Now, the increased immunogenicity of, I'll show you some data that it's just come off, of DNA with the same proteins with ASO1B adjuvant rather than MF59 adjuvant, which has been rather disappointing as it relates to the durability, and it's why we've had to give so many boosts uh, in 702 does provide an approach to furthering the development of this regimen during this prolonged manufacturing timeline. And evidence of a correlate would allow bridging to a regimen using ASO1B, which we don't have the durability data yet, but other kinds of vaccines su suggest it may do that. And, um, uh, and um, is, is sort of one approach that I think could be effective in helping this. Um, this is this complicated study, large study, um, uh, is essentially a study rather than AlVac um, uh, protein uh, with the clade C proteins. This is a DNA prime with the clade C proteins using um, both MF59 versus AOSO1B. This is a uh, slide from Georgia Tamaris. And you can see uh, on the left-hand side whether it's V1V2 antibody or uh, this is a GP40 IgG3 antibody and it's most of the binding antibodies one will see that both the prevalence as well as the magnitude are significantly higher in uh, ASO1B as compared to MF59. Um, that is also the same for the T cell responses uh, in this study. Um, uh, the, the red circles here 
are the MF59, so again, uh, lower prevalences uh, and lower um, magnitudes as compared to especially the, the, the higher dose um, ASO1B. So I think that sort of summarizes where I think these two sort of trials are. We wait and see. Um, we have um, uh, certainly epitope-specific responses and differences. It would be great if they both came in with partial success. It would be even better if they came in with partial success and they had relatively similar correlates of protection in some areas and maybe some specific ones that are slightly different that would actually lead us to where are other non-neutralizing areas of um, of essentially susceptibility to HIV, other than, let's say, the V1, V2 loop or, and or what are some functional antibody responses that are associated with non-neutralization that would lead us to, to give us a handle on how we could, you know, jack this up. And sort of that has been a very conscious strategy um, by the HVTN to sort of look at this non-neutralizing area and sort of take these shots on goal and see where we will go on that. Um, now, the, area, the next area was sort of the entering of the era of neutralization. And here again was a very defined strategy by the organization. Um, and that first defined strategy was to use passive immunization of broadly neutralizing antibody in a study to try and define what's the target of neutralization. What is the neutralizing antibody titer that would be associated with protection from acquisition? And that's the goal um, with the uh, VRC01 and the AMP study. Um, <clears throat> this is a study I've had the pleasure to do uh, with my friend Mike Cohn um, uh, from, with the HPTN, uh, as well as John Muscola from the VRC. And uh, we did two, again, simultaneously trials. Uh, one of them is in, in uh, Sub Saharan African women, Clade C, the other one in MSM, Clade B. Um, whether it's clade or gender, um, uh, they are going to be um, uh, correlated uh, and cofactors uh, both in the vaccine trials as well as in the AMP trial. Antibody-mediated prevention. Um, <clears throat> this has been an amazing study, uh, fully enrolled, almost um, completed. Um, I'll show you the slide. We will essentially have this data in July of 2020, approximately then in which we have actually given 44,000 IV infusions um, uh, to uh, 2,400 MSM uh, in North and South America and 1,900 women in Sub-Saharan Africa. They were opened in April and May of 2016. They were accrued uh, essentially in the fall of 2018. 1924-2701, um, <clears throat> 2701 96% uh, retention rate uh, and essentially 100% adherence. Uh, we have not had one, to my knowledge, uh, um, infusion um, infection associated with these 44,000 IV uh, administrations. And uh, it's been unbelievable what the study sites have done uh, and what the um, uh, participants have had. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we, these studies, um, essentially, we think the study will go to its end. Um, uh, and. Uh, we are simultaneously, at the, uh, many people in this room are working on this, uh, doing sort of real-time analysis of um, not only um, looking at the TCMB assay for um, breakthroughs and sensitivities, um, sequencing the breakthrough isolates, measuring their sensitivities, um, uh, and uh, looking for resistance and susceptibility as it relates to the, to the titers um, of, of, the, of antibody. Now, <clears throat> the, we have studied the PK of the antibodies really well. Um, we can impute by the day of infection. Uh, and con conceptually, this study was uh, achieved to, to sort of say, gee, what is, we should have reasonably large differences in acquisition in the first four weeks after the infusion versus the second four weeks after the infusion. Um, titers are um, from 200 to 50 in the first four weeks and from 50 to 30 in the high-dose group in the second four weeks, um, and they're from 100 to 30 in the lower-dose group um, and from uh, 20 to 5 uh, in the, in the lower-dose group in the second four weeks. Now, what has, um, uh, what has come 
recently, two and a half years after uh, we started the VRC, has been a, a meta-analysis in the non-human primate of passive antibody challenges of single infusion of monoclonal antibodies with SHIV challenge after monoclonal antibody infusion. This recently published article um, was, um, uh, gave us some good news and some sobering news. Um, first of all, the meta-analysis uh, here is of um, 13 published studies and has 274 non-human primates. Uh, it was a wonderful collaboration for all the groups um, that have uh, worked uh, in uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies and their challenges in non-human primates, and they're listed here. Many of you are again in this room. Um, the wonderful thing about it is, is that we show that the main correlate of protection, irrespective of whether uh, what antibody you used, what challenge virus we were used, and sort of how you used that challenge virus was neutralization. And you get this beautiful S-shaped curve. And one of the other nice things about it is the <coughs> steepness of that S-shaped curve. But the titers are substantive, and these are ID50s, and so I'll show you the ID80s in a minute. But you need a titer of around 1 to 50 for 50% 50 protection, uh, 1 to 130 for 75% protection. And to get where you want to get 95% protection, it's about a titer of 600 to 700 uh, of a neutralization titer. Frankly, higher than what we thought we would get or needed um, if, the, if the human follows the non-human primate. We've done some, you know, projections, and um, this is, uh, you know, can keep me up. It can keep me happy sometimes and keep me unhappy so other times. Um, and it's a rather complicated slide, but it, um, it, it says if the human is like the non-human primate, what would we expect to get uh, in the AMP trial? So it's a little bit funny because, you know, fun to do. So this is all meaningless until we get to July, but it's sort of fun. So this is the high dose group, um, and this is if the titer is 1 to 50 for protection, and this is it is for 1 to 100. So in the first four weeks, we get really nice protection. Um, uh, the lower growth group, not so great. And then for the second four weeks, it would be 50% and 30%. At the, at the low dose group, um, the best we would ever get is in the 50% uh, at 1 to 50, probably more realistically. When the 100, it would be less than 40%. In the second week, 14%. Um, and 27%. So um, that's sort of if the human is the non-human primate. So our overall efficacy will really be based on, A, the sensitivity of the viruses, um, the time of infusion, um, and the titer. And we expect that to happen. And, and sort of for this group, I felt that this, uh, this slide would be a useful way of um, us as a field starting to conceptually think about how the AMP results will look. Now, obviously, IV administration is not what we're doing uh, for public health points of view. Um, I think broadly neutralizing antibodies in combination of BNABs, again, are going to be discussed. Um, certainly, the um, self-administered subcutaneous injections with extended half-life preparations, usually from um, the LS mutations, um, are going to be discussed later in this by, by Julie. And there are marked changes in the half-lives. Uh, some of these antibodies may be able to come up with a regimen for four to six months. New antibodies, more potent antibodies are being developed all the time. And the strategy that the HVTN has about this whole BNAP field is to, again, to, to make neutralization, and whether that's going to be the TSMB assay or some other assay, um, the correlate of protection. There will be always new antibodies. Um, and if we can make it, make correlates of, of, if we can make neutralization similar to RNA viral load, like it does like an ART, and I think there's no reason to think that this cannot happen, that, that we will then simplify the further development of this field. And then allows just bridging studies to be done for new combinations and new antibodies. And it's probably the single most important thing that we're doing and the single most important component of the strategy that we have. Um, other people will call it, talk about increased coverage of, of, by multiple antibodies, whether it's two antibodies or three antibodies. Uh, do you need double protection, or do you want to have two antibodies cover every virus? 
It's a little bit different than some of the um, ART mutations here. There's no evidence that there's a selective um, pressure for, for um, viability um, by having a neutralization resistant isolate. They're fully, um, they tend to be fully uh, pathogenic. So the concept of wanting to have two antibodies on uh, to cover every virus, uh, you'll be hearing about coverage and potency later on, but these kinds of curves um, talk about that. Um, here's a table that actually looks at ID80s and, and basically shows that three antibodies um, um, may be the most optimal to have double coverage. It is where we as a strategy for the HVTN are at the moment going is to take um, a CD4 binding antibody, a, a V3 loop antibody, and a V2 loop antibody, put them together in a three-dose three, three dose combination that will essentially give double, double coverage and sort of take, and, and sort of that's the goal at the moment waiting, depending on what the target will be. Um, we should get that out of the AMP trial, and that should allow us to define what double and triple combinations and, uh, um, that we should be able to approve to do the next uh, um, efficacy trial, which would really be one that we would design a regimen that would get us into the 90s because that's what we really need to compete with antiretrovirals uh, and for this field. Antibodies are being made cheaper and cheaper, um, but we need to get into the 90s. Um, and if we can get into the 90s, then we will make an impact um, uh, and have this happen. This is a transition into what I'll call the BNAB-inducing immunogen area, era. Um, and just to categorize that and put your hands around it, we've made this sort of um, slide. This has been led by, again, Bart and Dennis, who are in the room, uh, and Peter Kwong. There are stable trimers in vaccine designs. These are stabilized trimers designed to elicit BNABs or boost after the germline or lineage priming. There are lineage-based vaccine designs, which is a series of immunogens derived from the sequence of OM variants and case studies of BNAB development from natural infection. There's germline targeting vaccine design, which is essentially just to prime the germline. Priming immunogens engineered to broadly activate diverse precursors within a BNAB class, you will then boost um, immunogens are more native life. So the germline targeting um, all have sort of stable trimer vaccine designs in their future, so to speak. Um, and there's epitope-based vaccine designs. Um, uh, immunogen sequence designed to focus response to one or more particular epitopes, but germline ag agnostic. This is sort of my favorite because I think one of the issues that we have in vaccine design is similar to influenza is the virus makes distracting antibodies. And we have no way really at the moment to define what those distracting antibodies are and how, to, let alone how to eliminate them. And epitope-specific designs are combinations of epitope-specific designs sort of focus us on just the epitopes that we know are going to be um, sort of defined um, uh, to be susceptible areas. And I think as a way of, at the moment is the best way in my opinion to sort of construct something that doesn't have the distractors. Um, but I do think getting a clever approach of identifying distracting antibodies is really gonna be something that is important to us in this field. Now, the first insight of, um, about neutralization actually, again, is from Dennis's group. Um, done a lot of uh, Sentinel work here. Uh, this is an immunization with a BG505 trimer. But what is putting this slide up, which uh, is a slide from, um, from Dennis as well as John Mascola, is that while the, the good news is, is that they got protection, it was autologous protection, it wasn't heterologous protection, but if you look at the 50% and 95% protection limits, they are essentially identical with this BNAB as to the non-human primate passive immunization. So there's consistency in the models with respect to the imaging. And the good news to me is, again, is that neutralization um, gives us the sense that neutralization will be a marker um, for where we need to go. Now, this is a, uh, a listing of the energy of the field. Now, these next three slides give me heartburn because I don't really quite know how we're gonna be able to mix and match these uh, in a rational way yet, but that's our job and we'll figure it out with the people in this room. But there are a lot of trimers being made um, by a lot of different people. 
And, um, you know, this is sort of the design intent and features, its potential uses as people conceive them. Uh, although the UFO vaccination, I, I, you know, I didn't know that, that, that I said, I looked at that for a while and I said, okay, we are in a UFO kind of position as a field, but it means uncleaved, pre-fusion pre optimized, stabilized trimer. Um, um, so there are a lot of trimers. How, how different they will be, what kinds of results we will get, um, you know, we'll just have to do them as quickly and as iteratively as we can. Germline targeting imagings um, in GMP or phase one trials. Again, um, uh, this group knows about EOD, Bill Schiff's um, program and the CH505 uh, from BART. Um, again, there are a lot of, lot of different germline targeting imagings. And again, uh, how do we define um, their success? And will one do better than the other? And how do we then follow them up? Um, <clears throat> This is the EOD um, self-assembling nano nanoparticle to elicit VRCO1 class antibodies. That already uh, uh, is in a phase one study, but it has, uh, has one started. Um, it is to um, uh, stimulate uh, na naive B cell lineages of the VRCO1 class. Um, it's being conducted at Seattle and GW, and GW um, with B cell sorting and B cell sequencing. Um, as the endpoints, and I think that's the interesting issue here of using B cell sequencing um, of a uh, intermediate uh, of vaccine elicited VRCO1 class sequences with relatively low somatic hybridization, uh, and won't won't be neutralizing, um, but will be of the VRCO1 class. Um, <clears throat> the lineage and epitope-based immunogens um, are here uh, again. I think a lot of this is going to be discussed in later parts of this um, uh, uh, of this meeting. Again, this to give you the sense of an overview that the lineage-based um, envelopes that are mainly GP120s that come out of BART group, and the epitope-based envelopes, um, um, both the Mper peptide liposome out of BART and the fusion peptide from Peter Kwong in the VRC. These are just sort of the sequence here of a lineage uh, envelope. Um, Imagen from BART, I'm sure you'll see the slide again, that looks um, at, from a case study of someone uh, who developed uh, BNABs of the VRCO1 class, looking at the, the key uh, imagens that were isolated um, uh, from that person over time, in the hope that um, one can partially mimic this by giving this to um, naive uh, HIV uninfected adults. Um, once you get that lineage, the goal is to get to tier two neutralization. Um, uh, essentially, 75% of the cl clinical strains in the world are, are tier two, and 15% are, are up to tier three. Tier two being, you know, at the, at the 400 level for an ID50, tier three being at the 600 to 700 level. Um, um, so we need to get a fair amount of neutralization. Uh, epitope is designed. This is. Uh, Peter is on the on the on the um, on the program, and I shouldn't be showing um, what he will explain a hell of a lot better. The bottom of the line is is of uh, this slide. Um, this is when will we know things? Um, can the BNAB protect how much is needed? We'll know that in July, in the, the middle of 2020. Can non-neutralizing vaccines reproducibly uh, reduce acquisition? That's going to be t sort of at the end of 2021 to the time of 2022. Um, can we induce serum neutralizing antibodies at greater than 100 in the first set of all those vaccines? Um, I think we will give us a couple years. Uh, we should be able to get that in 2022, 2023. And do we have a vaccine with greater than 60% eff efficacy? Well, if it's non-newt, we're going to know about that in 2002. I'm hoping if it's a newt-related, we will get that in 2025. Very sobering for uh, career planning as well as retirement. Um, uh, now, we, in the monoclonal antibody business, um, uh, we are already at the phase to be monoclonal antibodies. Um, we are hoping to start the phase threes um, uh, very early in 2022. Maybe we'll get something um, in 2021 with Michelle's antibodies. We'll find out more from him. Um, and um, if we do that, then we will 
um, we need two, two and a half years to, to do the kind of efficacy study that, that, uh, that is needed to, to pull this off. All these studies are about two to two and a half years to work. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, I've already covered these, um, and I think it's the bottom line that I actually wanted to have, um, you know, just outline uh, as I see it from, from where I sit um, uh, as it relates to these programs. So if any of the HIV vaccines or antibodies in efficacy trials testing are effective, I think it unleashes an enormous explosion in scientific inquiry to improve, adapt, and most importantly, bring to the world a new form of HIV prevention. Yes, an HIV vaccine will be the most complex vaccine ever designed. Yes, the regimens will be an implementation challenge. But yes, vaccination will disrupt the way we even diagnose HIV, um, um, especially if it, if, uh, uh, if it has anything to do with GP41. Um, vaccines, however, will overcome the current barriers to population-based control of HIV and provide a tool that could get us to an HIV generation, a reality that is not present with the current tools. And yes, the science behind such a vaccine will have, I'm sure, additional spinoffs. So for all of us in this room, we got our work cut out for ourselves, but we also have uh, an incredible opportunity to change the world. Uh, it's 50 years of an epidemic. I don't think that there's any epidemic on Earth that has gone on for 50 years. Um, it's been the epidemic of our generation, and it will continue to be that epidemic until we solve it. So my acknowledgments here are you know, all the study staff, the community engagement teams, and most of all the participants who joined the journey. I think you'll find the amazing logistics that happened with this uh, in Glendon's talk are the vaccine, the Juke Chavi D, the Scripps Chavi D, um, the HVTN lab program, um, our uh, commercial partners, uh, the HVTN, uh, our funders, the DAIDS vaccine research programs our enormous collaborators um, in Africa and the U.S. and South America and Europe, um, the acknowledgments to our major funders for 702 and 705 and everybody else in the room here. Um, uh, the HVTN is an organization that now has 82 clinical trial sites. Um, and um, it's 19, when, uh, when I started, when I founded this organization 20 years ago, you know, we had uh, eight in the United States and a couple in, in Brazil. And so we've come a long way um, as a field. Um, maybe we haven't iterated as quickly as we would have liked, and I think that's the issue for us in, the, in this BNAB uh, image and field with a plethora of BNABs. How do we iterate this quick enough so that we meet these timelines? I think that is a major issue for us who work in this field. Um, uh, I think it's on the program about how to do this. Um, we've changed our methods. Robin is uh, going to talk about that. Um, I'll shut up and uh, start moderating. Uh, I hope I was reasonably close uh, to where I should be. Okay.